All right, that was one of the top songs, top five songs of 2004, the year that Mark Zuckerberg launched the Facebook. And um, on the homepage of the course, in fact, I'll do a share now. I've included a um, the actual a screenshot of the Facebook um, as it appeared to students at Harvard when Zuckerberg released uh, launched uh, his website for the first time. Let's go ahead and um, jump in there. Great. Uh, by the way, welcome, welcome. This is lab number, last number three of legal and ethical environment of business in this new RA reduced seating uh, adaptive learning format. And so what we're doing here for our adaptive learning, I've posted a link in the survey for those of you watching the class live. I'll also post a recording later. Um, and that survey will be the uh, activity, or I should say the activity for this class. And then I'll use those survey results to then introduce everyone to the main sources of um, intellectual property law, what I prefer to call the law of ideas. And so a great example of that would be this homepage. Uh, this homepage, you'll see at the very bottom, there is a, a copyright logo there, symbol. Uh, one of the cool things about copyright law is that the moment you create an original work, um, if that work can be affixed or published in a tangible medium of expression, Again, I'm borrowing sort of the common law and the Copyright Act of 1976, the legal formula. You, the creator, own the rights to that work. So just automatic, you know, the moment you create an original work. Um, there's also here, you look at the Facebook, right? Today, that's a, of course, it's Facebook. And Facebook also owns Instagram. And um, uh, although I understand that Mark Zuckerberg has quietly buried the metaverse, uh, they own the meta, uh, uh, you know, there's a number of trademarks that uh, uh, owns, or company owns, get valuable forms of intellectual property. Trademarks are used to distinguish goods and services. Um, also, we'll see the source code, um, probably a valuable uh, a trade secret, a commercially valuable idea that can be protected as a trade secret. Also, I'll discuss patents and patent law in this class. Uh, so um, what I want to do, though, is begin by showing you in the module is uh, I want to show you a short uh, clip clip of Peter Thiel explaining why he decided to invest in the Facebook. And Peter Thiel's investment in the Facebook, which made him you know, basically a billionaire, um, it's going to be uh, some stuff of Silicon Valley legend. And so hearing Peter Thiel in his own words explain why he invested in the Facebook um, is um, uh, will help to set the stage for the rest of this class. So I'm going to go and what I want to do is just show the class where you can find everything that I talk about. Uh, if you're enrolled in the class, you'll find it in the module. Um, if you're just watching this video, you know, uh, from some other class, you know, um, uh, then, um, you know, just to follow along, I'll do a screen share and I'll show you everything. Uh, so um, here is the Peter Thiel uh, interview. Now, before I show it, I'm going to say that um, um, Peter Thiel comes across as a very smug and arrogant, you know, uh, he comes across as a jerk. I'm just going to put it that way. But what he's about to say is super important. I submit to you probably the most important thing that I'm going to uh, uh, say in this class. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, show you uh, this interview. spot a winner as, as big as Zuckerberg? Well, it's, um, it, would probably, it probably would be somewhat misleading to say that uh, all of this could be, could be seen, uh, seen from, the, from the very... Um, I had looked at already a number of these uh, different social networking sites, and there were definitely a lot of the early attributes were quite good. They seemed very competent technically, which is actually um, strangely not true of many of the other companies. But I think one of the other 
Uh, one of the other things to always uh, focus, that I, I'm always very focused on this point is not just the product or the, the, the abilities of the people, but, um, but sort of the third part is what I would describe as the business model, the business strategy. And I think that's often um, not given enough weight uh, because um, you know, inventing something new uh, is generally good for the world. It doesn't mean that you automatically will do well as, a, as an inventor. In fact, most scientists and inventors end up uh, doing disturbingly, capturing disturbingly little of the value you create. To succeed as an inventor or a scientist or entrepreneur, you have to create X dollars of value for the world, and you have to capture Y percent of X. And uh, the, the one important detail people forget is that X and Y are completely independent variables. Um, and that in most cases, Y equals 0%. Um, and this is sort of... Uh, that has certainly been my own experience. <laughs> Um, let me see if I got out of the screen share there. I will, hope I didn't do that prematurely. Uh, but um, what Peter Thiel said there is actually important, though. He comes across as a complete smug uh, jerk. You know, maybe, you know, he's a billionaire, right? Uh, but what he's saying is that it's not enough to succeed in business. It's not enough to come up with a good idea for a product or a service, you know, or, or for a business you know, uh, as normally what we're focusing on, you know, a good idea, but that's not enough. You have to figure out a way that you can actually capture some of the value of that idea. When he talks about this X and Y variables being X being a good idea for a business, a good idea for a product or service, but Y being, y being um, a method to, uh, 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 to make money from your idea. And that is fundamentally important. That is why I've devoted an entire module to what I call the law of ideas, because intellectual property law, as it's more commonly known, is how you can, you know, draw a connection between X and Y. It's how you can get to own your ideas or the expression of your ideas. And so, intellectual property at the end of the day i would say is you know once we've covered the main sources of law as we did in class number one um once we cover the common law which is provide the basic background rules for promises and accidents and property rights intellectual property the law of ideas is really central to to to, to business enterprise and so um it also expands our understanding of how we look at law normally when we think of the law, right, we're thinking of um, we're thinking of penalties. We're thinking of the law as something you just want to avoid at all costs. You know, um, you want to avoid getting sued. You want to avoid getting punished. But the law is not just about you know. Uh, a, a, the law is a big part of that. You know, compliance and avoiding penalty, right, um, and avoiding getting sued and that kind of thing as we far in the course. But what's really cool about the law of ideas or intellectual property law is the law is also about helping you basically, you know, own your ideas, make money from your ideas. The law is about, you know, protecting your ideas and the expression of your ideas. So this is a really fascinating thing. So I'm going to put, I put in the chat, I'll put it one more time, um, uh, the uh, for today's class. Um, and this will... Uh, those of you enrolled in the class, this is your uh, 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 um, a, a attendance uh, participation points for the class. And then hopefully you'll want to stick around. You know, what, what I'll do is I'll now I'll go into survey statistics and uh, discuss the results of the survey as a way of introducing you to these four main areas of intellectual pr property, uh, beginning with the first question in the survey, have you ever created any intellectual property? So let's, let's start there, and um, I um, survey, and then we can go into survey statistics. Oh, by the way, um, while I do this, I want to tell you something that's not in the movie. 
that is super, super important, relevant, um, some um, more information about Peter Thiel's decision vest uh, in the Facebook, you know? In the movie, there's uh, that great film clip where Mark Zuckerberg and uh, 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 Sean Parker, played by Jesse Eisenberg and uh, Justin Timberlake, respectively, they're going up the elevator to meet Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel says, congratulations. And invest five hundred thousand dollars in your company, and we're going to set it as a Delaware corporation. Now, I'll say more about why Facebook. In fact, why most big, you know, Fortune five hundred companies, companies on the New York Stock Exchange and the Nasdaq. Why so many come prefer to register in Delaware of all the fifty states? I tell you, Peter Thiel's decision to invest the five hundred thousand dollars. Right, most people, you know, you know. Um, how um, that uh, this is sort of like a private offering, you know what I mean? Like Shark Tank, you know, I'll give you, you know, um, uh, you know I'll give you the money you're asking for, but you give me 20, 30, 40% of the company is what makes Shark Tank so interesting. You know, do the entrepreneurs have a good idea for a business? And then are the sharks going to invest? And if they are going to invest, then what's the term of the investments? What's interesting with the movie, The Social Network doesn't tell you about Peter Thiel's decision to invest $500,000 in, 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 in the Facebook, it does get the basic facts right. Peter Thiel makes this decision as early as July of 2004, literally just five months after the Facebook is first launched. But what the movie does tell you is that the $500,000 investment was structured as a loan. And that repay the loan if Facebook, um, the Facebook, later to become Facebook, if Facebook obtained a million members by the end of the year. Uh, so um, the idea is what Peter Thiel is basically saying, hey, look, I'm just going to give you this half million dollars. You know what I mean? Um, if you get a million members, you don't have to pay me back. You know, if you come close to it, you know, um, we'll talk about, you know, what the terms are. But all Peter Thiel is saying, look, I'm giving you half a million dollars and then when you are ready to sell shares in your, you know, uh, 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 and, uh, you know, the first offering, um, then I want to be first in line to buy your shares, you know. Um, so that's really remarkable because normally, you know, when you're, when you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to attack, uh, attract investors, normally you've got to make what's called a, Fausti, a Faustian pact, a pact with the devil. That's why, it's, that's why it's called Shark Tank. That's why the investors are called sharks. Because yeah, they're going to give you the money, but they're going to want a big piece of your company, you know, 10, 20, 30, even more a percent of your company. And if you think about it, that's giving up a lot of your company at an early stage, you know? And so here comes Peter Thiel saying, basically, I'm going to give you half a million dollars. That's how valuable that intellectual property Mark Zuckerberg had developed. All right. Um, I just got a little notice on my end that my internet connection is unstable for some reason at this hour. You know, I've been getting cut off. Um, I'm going to ask you for those watching the class live, just stay on the line. I have a backup device. I'm going to try to fight through and use my main desktop computer so I can do the screen share and show you the survey results in real time. Uh, so let's go ahead and do the screen share. I have pulled up the survey. And um, I'll go into survey statistics. Now, this will take us a big class. Um, the five regular sections have I've met this is a now makeup uh section uh via the zoom format and so let's i think we have our results in here no it's they're still being loaded okay great so yeah we have now about uh, uh let's see here almost 600 so i would say three quarters of the class we're getting almost everybody in there um so as i said the first class is have you created intellectual property and i've included here right uh, a, a visual of what the four main types of intellectual property. Now, that's what I'm going to do in the rest of the survey, the rest of the class, is describe these main four types of intellectual property. Uh, but just off the bat, um, if, you, if, we look at these, uh, if we look at these results, we're seeing that um, only 22% of the class says that they've created intellectual property. So the vast majority, 78% say no, have not created intellectual property. Well, guess what? This, you're wrong. Everybody, everybody in the class has created intellectual property. If you've taken a picture on your phone, a selfie or a picture of something, that is technically you own the rights to that picture that you took. Uh, every discussion post that you've submitted in this class, every essay you've written, that is technically
technically your intellectual property. Anytime you, the, the copyright law defines work very broadly, you know, anything that you create, it could be a poem, it could be a, a, a script for a movie, it could be um, a dance composition or a ballet choreography, it could be, um, you know, uh, uh, art, it could be a sculpture, it could be anything that your imagination can create um, is, is you own the rights to it. The only requirement is that it be original, you know, not a copy. Um, but this raises a question. There is, there is um, can you copyright a tattoo? This is the, my next survey question. Can you copyright a tattoo? So I use, you know, many of you may have heard of this case, famous case involving Mike Tyson's tattoo where the tattoo artist sued Warner Brothers because in one of the Hangover movies, Hangover Part Two, the one is set in Bangkok, one of the characters, uh, I think it's Stewie, gets a, Ed Holmes, you know, in real life, he gets a tattoo in the movie, um, you know, uh, that looks very similar to, uh, to uh, Mike Tyson face tattoo. But then this raises an interesting question, can you copy tattoo? And there is, you know, the one thing that you cannot copy, right? is basically fashion designs and you know uh, articles of clothing and you know fashion accessories and if we look at this you know look at our class results here this is a 40 60 split only you know 40 percent of the class think, think you can copyright a tattoo after all a tattoo is a, as long as it's a creative work as long as you're not copying somebody else's co uh, tattoo design but notice 60 percent is saying no by analogy maybe a tattoo because you wear it on your skin a tattoo can be considered more like an article of fashion. And so, again, I asked this question just to show you the outer limits of copyright law, right? This is an open legal question because cases like this um, and others involving whether you can copyright a tattoo have either been dismissed, settled out of court, or are currently on appeal. So we're still waiting for a binding precedent here, and it hasn't been decided by the U.S. Supreme Court, and Congress has not clarified in the, you know, has not amended the Copyright Act of 1976 to clarify whether a tattoo is more like a fashion design or more like a, you know, a work. Um, so that is an open question. And this is, goes to show you, I just want to reiterate, I don't want you to ever forget the quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes that we saw in the previous class, life of the law is not logic, it has been experience, right? However, the courts come down on this when it does get decided, or if Congress were to make uh, you know, uh, were to fill the gap, you know, both of the I move on and do the rest of this. I love this quote by Mike Tyson, it's probably right up there with Oliver Wendell Holmes quote about the common law. Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. I say that because I'm teaching this class in the College of Business. These are uh, my students are majors you know, economics, finance, accounting. And the thing you see in business, I think this is a great quote. You know, I think of Blockbuster, you know, Blockbuster video. This was the biggest video chain in the world, you know, until Netflix punched them in the mouth. Now there's just one Blockbuster video store left in the entire world. It's in Oregon, you can Google it, you know, and it's become a tourist attraction. Um, think of Blackberry, right? The most popular, smartphone in the world until they got punched in the mouth by iPhone, right? And then Samsung Galaxy. How many people do you know carry around a Blackberry, right? You probably have to go to a museum, you know what I mean? To see a Blackberry today, you know? And that was the most advanced, uh, 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 best-selling phone, you know, smartphone. It was the original smartphone. And I could go on and on. In your personal life, you could uh, suffer setbacks. You could get punched in the mouth. You could have a, you know, a breakup in a relationship, you could have a, you know, a loss in your family, a loved one, you know, any number, you could have a setback in your career, you know, um, but, but, but Tyson, I think what he's teaching us, whether it's business, personal life, or in the ring, you know, um, you have to adapt. When you see that conditions change, you have to basically come up with a new plan, you know, um, and I think that's probably the best piece of advice that, you know, I can give you, uh, and, and, as, and I love that quote by Mike Tyson. All right, let's continue. Uh, my next question has to do with uh, trademark law. And I want to bring in OpenAI uh, GPT-3 large language model, which its commercial trade name is um, uh, 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 ChatGPT. Um, all right, so ChatGPT, and I've included in the module 
the actual trademark application that OpenAI filed with the United States Patent and Trademark Office in on December 27th, 2022. Um, basically a few weeks after they released GPT-3 to the public and um, um, uh, they you know, register for the trademark. And I show you this um, because um, trademarks like copyrights are protected at, by the common law. So you actually don't need a registration in order to own the rights to your creative works or to your marks, you know, your trademarks, service marks. However, there is an advantage of if your trademarks or copyrights have put potential commercial value, there is a huge advantage of registration. And that advantage is registration establishes definitive proof of who the owner of the mark or the copyright, as the case may be, uh, is. And um, registration, because this would be under federal law, gives you federal jurisdiction. You can go to any federal court in the United States to enforce your rights. And thirdly, registration gives you nationwide protection. Your rights are, you know, valid throughout the United States. Uh, without registration, your trademark uh, and your copyright, right? It's only going to be protected in those jurisdiction in which you're in those places in which you're actually using your marks, you know, or using your copyrights. You know, so it's only going to be, and it's you're gonna have to go to state or local court, you know, generally speaking about the advantages and disadvantages of federal court versus state court in our very next class after spring break, which is the module uh, class number four on civil and criminal cases. But for now, uh, I want to say something special about trademarks. With trademarks, the one thing is your trademark has to be distinct and you have to be providing the good or service to which you want your trademark attached to. You have to be in business. You have to be in commerce. You actually have to be providing or selling or in the market for your goods and services. So this is probably one reason why ChatGPT, or I should say OpenAI, waited until you know a few weeks after they released their, um, uh, their OpenAI GPT-3 large language model to actually register trademark. Actually, I think somebody may have missed up because um, I have included a video from a guest lecturer uh, from Colorado. Uh, um, um, uh, Aiden Kramer. Um, she's a great lawyer. I, I, I love her videos. Um, she's a small business lawyer. And she explains, you know, this is true. You can always get provisional trademark application if you plan to use your trademark within. But the thing about trade, is you have to be in commerce. You have to be providing the goods and services, either selling them or providing them to the public, you know, uh, online and then you can get your trademark registration and your trademark has to be distinct. But this raises an interesting question. Is chat GPT generic or is it distinct? If it's generic, you get no protection, right? Um, GPT, and actually let me, um, let me, um, let me see if I can, uh, oh, I'm in the screen share. I, GPT actually stands for, I believe it's um, generative performing training model, if I'm not mistaken, actually stands for something. It's an acronym. Like MLB stands for Major League Baseball. And chat is just a general, is a word, right? You know, uh, because with uh, chat, GPT-3 is, is basically operates as a chat bot. If you're able to, lucky enough to, you know, you've signed up for the service and it's not a capacity and you're able to get on, try to get on before this class, but I wasn't able to, so I won't be doing a demo of chat GPT. But you basically put your query, your command, and the and like a like a magical genie, the GPT three model will answer your question. You know, very in a very natural language. Um, and so, uh, but here, uh, what type of mark is would GPT three? And and you see, these are the five categories that are recognized. And the thing is, to really get trademark protection, your mark either has to be fanciful or arbitrary. You know. If your mark is merely suggestive or descriptive, then as a general matter, you're going to have to prove to the courts or in the first instance to the United States Patent and Trade that your mark has a secondary meaning, that the public, you know, consumers associate your mark with your brand, you know, we, uh, your brand, I should say, your mark with your products or services. Um, with fanciful and arbitrary, though, these are the 
Um, Fanciful is, here are some great examples. I would say, I would add Google to that list. You know, Fanciful, Mark, is just a completely made up word to describe a good or service. You know, Pepsi to describe a uh, soda pop. Uh, Kodak to describe, you know, film, et cetera. Exxon to describe petroleum, right? There's totally made up words that didn't exist. Arbitrary are words, those and symbols that already exist but that are used in a new and novel way to describe something that has nothing to do with the word. So Apple computers and the Apple logo is a great example of this, right? Um, an Apple to describe, you know, a uh, electronic, you know, personal computing, now iPods, you know, in the early 2000s, uh, now Apple watches and iPads, you know, in this day and age, right? Completely, uh, that's why it's called arbitrary. Uh, suggestive and descriptive, right? A suggestive mark kind of implies the product or service to which the mark applies. So Holiday Inn, normally when you go to a hotel, you're on vacation, you're on holiday, as they say in Britain, you know, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? Um, it's a brand, right? Not just chicken from Kentucky or with the recipe from Kentucky. So there, there has to be a secondary meaning. Finally, generic, you know, like a word like chair or elevator, you know, or music. You can't, you know, you can't use those words to describe chairs, you know, uh, 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 elevators and, and, and music products, you know, and services, right? And also look at these that are on this column that I'm showing you on the, those were all protected registered trademarks at one point in time, but those marks became so synonymous with the entire industry of products that, you know, um, aspirin basically to describe any headache medicine, you know, uh, escalator to describe any moving uh, 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 stairwell, um, shredded wheat to describe any kind of, you know, healthy type of uh, uh, breakfast cereal, yo-yo uh, to describe any toy that, you know, with the string and the goes, you know, and the, and the actual thing that goes up and down, right? Uh, Frisbee would be another example. Google, what about Google? Has Google become generic? You know, you can actually become a victim of your success. And by the way, this is why I said from day one, you always want to consult a business attorney and intellectual with, with, with knowledge of intellectual property law, maybe even an IP attorney specialist, because what companies do like Google, they will, or think of Mickey Mouse, right? The Mickey Mouse copyright is going to go into the public domain uh, at the end of this year, right? So what, 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 Google, what, what Disney has done is not just copyright Mickey Mouse, also register a trademark. You know, so as long as Disney is selling merchandise with the Mickey Mouse, you know, Mickey Mouse merchandise, right? Disney will continue to own the trademark. And so, yeah, uh, you know, the copyright may fall onto, uh, into public domain, but the Disney will still own the trademark because the deal with trademark is as long as you're still using the mark to describe your goods and services, you can renew your trademark registration every 10 years indefinitely, you know? Whereas copyrights, if it's a business-owned copyright, will expire after 95 years. So um, same thing with Google. I'm sure Google, in addition to having a trademark, I'm sure Google has copyrighted their Google logo. So if the copyright, for, I'm sorry, if the trademark for Google becomes generic, you know, uh, one day a court rules such uh, as such, then um, then Google will still own the copyright, you know, and it'll own that copyright for, you know, 95 years from whenever they first registered it. Okay, so, um, or created the Google logo. Uh, so here, uh, the, what does the class think about chat GPT? And you can see 12% and another 12% said um, it was fanciful, fanciful or arbitrary. That adds up to 24%. So one quarter of the class thinks this is gonna get automatic trademark protection. By the way, I checked this morning and the trademark application is still pending. This is a real time question. Um, at the opposite end of the scale, Another 12%, we have a tie here for last place. Say that it's completely generic. You know, GPT actually stands for something, you know, um, in the computer science uh, field. And the word chat is just a generic chat, you know. Notice another 12 is saying it's descriptive, you know, just describing the chat bot. And 19%, uh, I'm sorry, 19%. So that came in second place. And the um, though it didn't get a majority, the answer choice to get the mo most votes, you know, here, 45%. Uh, say that it's suggestive. And I, believe, I would probably agree with the class there. But again, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the life of the law is not logic. It has been experience, right? The trademark office, the USPTO is going to have to make a judgment call how to classify 
chat GPT. And frankly, I think you can make a good argument. You know, it's kind of subjective. You can make a good argument. This is a new thing, right? Um, so we'll see. I'll keep this. I'll keep the class uh, informed in real time, you know, and then do a supplementary video once we hear back from the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, uh, you know, are they going to register uh, chat GPT or is it generic? Or if they are going to register it, you know, what type and where in the spectrum of distinctness, you know, does the chat GPT mark fall under? But I think it's really exciting, you know, um, and we'll see this in real time. Now, uh, my next question has to do with um, um, patents versus trade secrets. Copyright law allows you to protect the expression of your ideas. Your froze in real. It looks like I'm still on. So let me back up here. Copyright law um, allows you to protect the expression of your ideas, as I was saying. Trademark law allows you to protect your brand, you know, the way you distinguish your goods and services from similar goods and services by other, you know, uh, uh, producers, you know, by other competitors. But trademark and secret, uh, a, a trade, uh, sorry, trade secret and patent law the last two areas of intellectual property actually allow you to protect your underlying ideas. And so I want to say that, you know, I think before OpenAI developed the GPT-3 model, and I know other companies are developing their own artificial intelligence uh, models, you know, I would say that the Google PageRank algorithm, which is what how the uh, Google search engine works, I would say that was probably up to today, the single most valuable commercial idea probably in the history of capitalism, you know, history of the world, you know? And so what does the class think? How does Google protect its single most valuable idea? By the way, the way the PageRank algorithm works is that um, instead of just using key to determine, you know, uh, how relevant a, um, a web page would be based on the search that's put in the box, search engine box, um, it basically asks also how many other web pages link searched for and so it's the number of links also helps to determine probabilistically the relevance of each web page and so it's, long story short it's kind of like a sophisticated elo chess ranking algorithm you know what i mean kind of that same spirit probabilistic you know uh but here and and here i've included by the way just a uh, quick highlights of what the main similarities and differences All right, we're back on. So I'll continue the screen share. What I was saying is the main similarities and differences between patent law and trade secret law. And the main difference is with a patent, you have to get that registered. You know, trade secret, however, there's no registration. It's pure common law. And in fact, trade secrets, unlike trademark and copyright law, there's no trademark option whatsoever. So trade secret is um, pure 
pure trade secret law is pure common law. So protected at the state level. And here's the thing. Now, there are some federal legislation, something called the Economic Espionage Act, that uh, makes it a federal crime for foreign nations and foreign uh, uh, um, assets to uh, uh, foreigners to uh, steal uh, U.S. intellectual property, including U.S. trade secrets. Uh, but it's state law that determines what ideas get trade secret protection. And here's the thing, to get protected as a trade secret, your idea has to be commercially valuable and you, the entrepreneur or the company, you know, most likely the company owns the trade secret, the company or the entrepreneur ha has to take reasonable measures or reasonable steps to keep the idea. By the way, where have you heard that before, right? Remember negligence law, remember, because it's all common law, like tort law, common law, accidents, you know? Unless we're talking about an abnormally dangerous activity, right? A business is only liable when it fails to take reasonable steps, right, uh, to avoid foreseeable injuries. Well, guess what? The common law of trade it's, it's, uses that same general standard, right? The idea has to be commercially valuable. In other words, it has to be something that people want to steal, and um, the owner has to take reasonable steps to keep their idea a secret. And so um, with patents, however, you have to do, you have to file, you have to file a patent registration. Let me show you, well, let's go to the survey results and then we'll answer about Google, how do they protect their page rank algorithm? So let's do the survey results. Um, and since we got cut off, let me go back into the uh, share. Here we go. And um, here are the classes saying 60 40 split, but the other 58 42. 58 of the class says that Google uses patent law to protect its page rank algorithm. And 42% of you know they use trade secret law, you know. Um, and guess what? Here, technically, everybody is right. Google does have a patent for the page rank algorithm. And I'm going to show it to you right now a patent that dates back to 1998 when it was first filed. But but almost every single modification and improvement and tweak that Google has made to Google search to the page rank algorithm itself, basically Google just uh, relies on California trade secret law, you know? Um, so like Google Maps, for example, you know, all the new features, you know, um, all the secret improvements that Google has made to their All right, this time it was on my end because my internet was slow. And so um, hopefully we won't get interrupted again. If we get interrupted one more time, I'll just go to my backup device. It won't allow me to do the screen share. But as promised, let me show you, when we got cut off, I wanted to show you Google's first patent and uh, explain why Google uses, or I should say Alphabet Inc., which owns Google, right? Um, why they use a, you know both patent law 
and um, trade secret law to protect what is probably their single most valuable idea. So uh, hold on here, let me just do a screen share. Here we go. All right, great. Here is the patents in the module and you'll see um, it, you know, Larry Page is the inventor. Now notice he had to assign the rights to his patent to Stanford University, right? Um, because this is sort of the work for hire doctrine, right? You know, when you work for somebody and you use their, you know, uh, you, you do R and D for a company, any research you do, right? Any ideas you come up with, is going to be owned by the company, unless you have an agreement, right? A legally enforceable contract, right? Supported by consideration as we've seen, right? In which, um, you come to an agreement that no, I own you know, the, the rights. And here, what ended up happening, by the way, UCF does this too with their UCF Office of um, Technology and Commercialization, right? Um, basically, the university wants to promote research and innovation. So what they'll do is they'll generally reach an agreement with its own researchers, say, look, if you come up with a new idea, yeah, technically it belongs to UCF under the work for hire doctrine, but UCF, let's work out some kind of arrangement, you know? Maybe I'll, I'll give you back the, uh, the patent rights or the intellectual property rights, you know, to the researcher, to Larry Page, in exchange, you know, Larry Page, you know, Google, you know, which was formed in 1998, will give the university, you know, a cut of the action, you know, maybe uh, there'll be a, 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 a finder's fee, a flat fee, here's a million bucks, you know, or more likely, you know, startup, okay, we'll give you 10% moving forward, you know, of any profits we make from the idea. So you can see it's kind of a win-win. The researcher and innovator has access to all the resources that the university can offer. And then the university has access to brilliant young minds who come up with new products and services. So you'll see this patent was uh, uh, filed on January 1st, 1998. And the thing is to get a patent, if you actually scroll down and look at the patent, it's gonna read like a mini scientific paper with a couple of simple illustrations explaining, you know, visualizing how uh, the page rank algorithm works, which is this probabilistic algorithm that ranks web pages based on how many other web pages link to the web page in question. That's the basic idea. So it, it, it is a mini scientific paper because to get a patent, three things, you have to show that your idea is new, novel. You have to show that it's useful. It actually does something, um, uh, um, um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, does, it solves a problem but you also have to show that your idea is non-obvious, and is non-obvious. And what that means is that given the state of scientific knowledge in 1998, you know, nobody else would have come up with the page rank algorithm. Nobody would have come up with the idea of using, you know, web pages that link, you know, the, 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 the number of links to a web page as a way of sorting, sorting search engine results. So um, the problem is, the, here's the deal. It's very hard to prove that an idea is obvious because Larry Page, after all, he came up with the page rank algorithm, you know? Uh, um, um, and so how do you prove something is non-obvious, right? Well, if you look at this, look at, look at the date of when this patent was actually granted, September 4th, 2001, highlighted it right here. It took Google, you know, with all the resources they have and Page and Sergey Brin, you know what I mean? All the venture capital they had. It took them almost four years to get this patent, to show that the page rank, you know, what, what, what would turn out to be uh, up until now, GPT-3 or chat GPT, what turned out probably the single most valuable commercial idea up until today, right? It took them almost four years to get that patent. Think about how expensive and time consuming, you know, getting that patent, uh, you know, getting for anybody, you know, even for Google, to get a patent. And also look at the date, right? This patent expired September 3rd, 2021. This patent's gone, you know? This patent, you know? So trade secret law has a number of really cool advantages in that with trade secret law, right? Your patent, as long as, it, as long as your idea is commercially valuable, continues to be commercially valuable, and as long as you continue to take reasonable steps to keep the idea a secret, you not only is there's no cost and time consuming registration procedure, you know, um, guess what? Your trade secret, you know, will last indefinitely for, you know? So this is why even companies like Google own a lot of 
patents and they invest in those, right? But they also own a lot of trade secrets because, and this is why you always want to consult with a you know intellectual property lawyer, experienced attorney in this field, right? Because they will, you based on your, you know, based on your business model, based on the products and services, based on your ideas, right? They can help you when it's just better to rely on trade secret law and when it's better just to go and do a formal patent, you know, registration. Uh, uh, um, so let's do our last survey question. And the last survey question has to do with the social network. Did Mark Zuckerberg steal the idea, right? It's one of the main themes of the movie. Uh, so um, let me just pull up the survey uh, 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 again, uh, because I got disconnected uh, with my internet. Um, and um, and then we'll look at those last survey results uh, for the last question. Uh, did Zuckerberg steal the idea? Let's see what the class thinks here. Um, let me go into screen share modality. Um, that is really the essence. And by the way, let me tell you, let me tell you the, the, the true story behind this, you know, uh, what you see in the movie and what, what really happened. In fact, in real life, the Winklevi, as Zuckerberg himself kind of re refers to the Winklevoss twins. Um, a lot of people don't know, but Zuckerberg, when he was in high school at Phillips Exeter Academy, he studied Latin. And so, you know, uh, he knows a lot of Latin phrases and stuff like that. So he kind of made up this thing, Winklevi. Um, um, uh, the, um, the Winklevoss twins sue are going to bring their initial complaint and we'll see the option, show it to you in the next module, in the next lab. And they're going to sue Mark Zuckerberg for misappropriation of trade secrets. So let's see what the class thinks here. Um, uh, what does the class think? Uh, oh, by the way, and I've shown you in this survey, these are what the two websites look like. I, I found a screenshot on the Wayback Machine. Uh, this on top is what you'll see is how Harvard Connection, later it became Connect U, was redesigned. But this was the website that Mark Zuckerberg was developing and what it looked like, you know, when apparently simultaneously he's developing the Facebook, you know what I mean? And there I've superimposed what the Facebook looked like. Now, notice here, it's a again, 60-40 split, 59% saying Zuckerberg stole the idea, 41% uh, saying that he didn't. Um, now, when we say someone did someone stole your idea or infringe on your intellectual property, remember, there's four different forms of intellectual property. So let's go through each one, trademark, copyright, patents, and trade secrets. So um, with trademark, the test for infringement is likelihood of confusion. Would the public be confused that the Facebook is Harvard Connection or vice versa? Here, I don't think there's any likelihood of confusion, right? Uh, these are just two different looking websites. Um, what is the test for copyright infringement? The test for copyright infringement is similarity. You know, are the two websites, you know, are the two forms of intellect, are the two forms of copyright, you know, are the two works similar or substantially similar? So, so substantial similarity test. Here, no substantial similarity, right? What about patents? Well, with patents, notice here, that's going to be irrelevant because um, no source code, none of the ideas that went into either of these websites were, you know, uh, patent pending or, you know, registered as a patent. So we can ignore patent. That does leave trade secret law. And as I just said, you know, um, the Winklevoss twins do sue Mark Zuckerberg for theft, you know, misappropriation of trade secrets at common law. And here's the thing, though. Notice, notice, right? 59% uh, right, said uh, that Zuckerberg stole the idea, but 41% said no. And I got to say, this is actually very close. Because while I agree, by the way, with the, I agree. The, by the way, there's no doubt Zuckerberg stole the idea, right? He stole the idea, right? The Winklevoss twins told him he had a, they had a great social network. You know, you have to have a Harvard email address. And Zuckerberg stole that idea. But here's the thing, right? Did the, did the Winklevi take reasonable steps to keep their idea a secret? And normally judges want to see a non-disclosure agreement or some type of contract with the confidentiality clause. You know, they want to see proof that the owner of the idea, in fact, that the, you know, took reasonable steps to keep it a secret. And of course, in real life, like the movie Social Network depicts, these are college kids, you know, there's no contracts or lawyers or anything like that, right? 
in you know in the founding of Facebook and in, in the development of Harvard Connection Connect You. So um, notice, right? This is actually a very close case, and this will give me a preview uh, for the next class because what happened in real life. Now you can understand why Mark Zuckerberg settled the case, right? Because imagine this goes to a jury, right? You know. 60% of this class thought that Zuckerberg stole the idea, you know, a persuasive lawyer could probably convince, you know, and in a civil case, you don't need a, you don't need unanimity, you just need a majority, you know, depending what state you're in, you know, and so, um, um, you know, you can see why Zuckerberg may have, may have, may have wanted to settle this case in real life, but why boss twins settle, right? Well, because, you know, they could, they could get zero dollars, right? It could be, you know, did they take reasonable steps to keep their idea a secret? That's questionable. You know, because they're not going to have proof of a non-disclosure agreement, right? Although um, in the next module, I'll go deeper into the case and I'll show you, you know, I'll, I'll show you the complaint. I'll show you a sworn statement by Victor Gao, the director of Harvard Connection before Mark Zuckerberg came on the scene. And the next class, we're basically going to look at when do you settle your litigation? When do you settle your case? And when do you go to a jury? And we'll see that's mu as much a strategic question as it is a legal question. And so we'll look at all the variables that go into that. And we'll see that actually, it turns out most civil and even criminal cases do settle out of court. Also in the next class, I want to introduce you to what is the single most important idea in the Anglo-American common law tradition. And that is the idea of due process. That is the idea of fairness. That's what we're going to do in the next class. All right. Thank you for your attention. Um, good night or good day, depending when you're watching this video. Um, God bless and charge on.